All right. Thank you for everybody coming back. I appreciate um, you coming and staying. Um, and if you're just getting here, well, welcome. Uh, again, I'm Tim Castillo. I'm the Director of Community Engagement Initiatives here at University of New Mexico. And just uh, happy to really start to um, build this network and really uh, advancing the state of New Mexico and really looking at how we improve uh, what we do in community engagement here at UNM. So with that, we've got a, a, another panel uh, of people that are running centers and institutes here at the university. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Renya Enfort, uh, who's going to talk to everybody about and moderate this session. So Renya, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. This microphone seems to be falling apart. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes? Okay, then I'll put this here. Um, so welcome everybody. It is great to see everybody here for another panel on discussing community engagement here. This panel is focusing on four centers and institutes initiatives um, here at UNM. Um, we're going to have four presenters. Each person is going to present about what they do, and then we will have a discussion, open discussion among any questions or thoughts you have, and then I have some questions as well. Um, I am a professor here in community and regional planning, and our four presenters today, Ted Hohola is the director of the Indig Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. Kiran Katira is the director of the Community Engagement Center. Shannon Sanchez Youngman is the Associate Director of the Center for Participatory Research. And Rob Del Campo is the Executive Director of Corporate and Community Engagement at the Anderson School of Management, and also the Executive Director of UNM's Innovation Academy. So we will ask them to present in that order. And so perhaps, Ted, you can start us off. Do I need to go up there? Or? Yeah, Ted, yeah. You, can, you can run it. I think you're all set up with the next slideshow. Great, thank you. Okay, so is there a mic attached to this or it doesn't matter? It seems like the pieces were falling off. Here we go. It's <laughs> falling apart like me. Oh, wow, it did. The, I don't know where the clip went, but uh, do you want to hold the microphone? Sure, I'll just hold it. Okay. I'll, um, can, is it okay that I speak at this level here? Um, because I actually have been trying to shake this bout of flu, which I've had for a number of days. So um, it's been a struggle, but nonetheless, you know, you got to go plow ahead. But um, I am Ted Hohola. I'm a uh, distinguished professor and regents professor here in the School of Architecture and Planning. And um, thank you for this opportunity in order to sort of talk a little bit about how it is that we go about our community engagement. So um, I just click here. Okay. So I'm director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute, which we lovingly call IDPI. And we were created in 2012. And basically our mission is essentially to uh, inform indigenous design and planning by engaging our faculty, our students, professionals in the community and culturally appropriate practices. And uh, specifically, we look at how it is that we can use culture and identity to help inform community engagement and design. So many of our kinds of projects that we have um, initiated have really been to kind of cut across <clears throat> three major groups of individuals from um, the kind of professional development side. Uh, of course, uh, from the academic side, uh, we've been fortunate in order to work within the community and regional planning program or department where I'm faculty as well as a number of other indigenous faculty as well too. And we have the only uh, indigenous planning um, certificate at the graduate level in the country. And we've actually been given the green light to develop an online indigenous planning certificate, which we're laying the groundwork for. But uh, the idea here is basically how do we, in a sense, position ourselves uh, to develop scholarship because we firmly are invested in an educational institution and it's a scholarship that will really essentially help to retain and continue to impact and influence uh, those that we hope are going to be coming up the ranks. 
And uh, the other major uh, group that we also work with are the tribes. Uh, largely, we focus here within the Southwest, but we have um, conversations with many, many other tribal organizations across the country through the networks that we partner with. And uh, just this uh, afternoon, <clears throat> a few hours ago, for example, we were talking with uh, uh, Native Alaskan community that's looking at uh, developing a memorial plan for a uh, Indian boarding school that they have just north of Nome, Alaska. So our reach is pretty far from the standpoint of trying to identify those tribes that are really receptive to the, to the idea of how they, they can use in particular their indigenous knowledge as a way to bring that vitality back into their community. And then uh, lastly, we also work with the professional community and have worked with the American Collegiate Schools of Planning and American Planning Association, as well as numbers of other organizations. Uh, we're laying groundwork with the American Council of Landscape Architects and uh, also have worked with the American Institute of Architects to begin to bring voice of our practitioners to the forefront, particularly since we're trying to bring our own intelligentsia, so to speak, in terms of assuming and taking over that role of how we go about um, providing uh, our own um, assistance and our own knowledge sets to, to local communities. So this just gives a very quick map of the kind of projects that we've done here in New Mexico. We have more that are outside um, and there's actually numbers here that we need to continue to add on to. We suspect that since we've um, developed, we've organized and uh, or assisted over a hundred tribal communities in some form or fashion. And we do it through our courses, we do it through uh, teams that we put together, and we also uh, support students who are working in these areas. So these are just some of the examples of the projects which we've completed. Uh, these ones represent uh, large uh, tribal community planning kinds of initiatives. You can see one all the way down there is in Cañard in Ecuador that we did a few years back. Um, here's examples of more specific kinds of projects that we've done, which are much more uh, focused in terms of their kind of scale, in terms of specific sort of project sites and work that we've done uh, with some of the communities here. Um, and this um, just gives the overall example of some of the partners that we brought into these initiatives who have either funded or endowed uh, the Institute in various types of ways. So that quickly is just an overview of how it is that we've um, gone uh, about the kind of tasks that we've been able to um, get done. And uh, really in a way um, we feel that we're kind of leading the charge in terms of what the discussions are nationally and internationally around, uh, especially indigenous planning, uh, getting some headway with indigenous design, but we're leaving some of that to our colleagues who are uh, in the architecture and landscape field. So uh, we've been working diligently with them and have just had great relationships across the board with all of our departments here in the School of Architecture and Planning, in particular with planning, with uh, landscape architecture and with architecture. So on that note, then I'll pass it on to our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, you know, he's mastered the art of being so succinct and 40 plus years of doing this work, right? So this won't be that, right? <laughs> I, I've only been doing this about 25 years, but um, you'll be like, what did you say? It's all over the place. But I will try to sort of share what we do at the um, Community Engagement Center. So I'm going to pull up. So it's anti-racist leadership for a just and kind world is the real, you know, emphasis of what we do. And know that that involves a lot of ways that we need to do that. Some of them are more sort of, and by the way, I won't be reading off slides. So you'll hear me ad lib and add things that you're like, where is that on the slide? <laughs> um, so the institutional change piece for sure has to happen, structural change. 
Um, even though we're about that leadership development of young people, and I'll get into that, but there's so many networks that the community engagement centers are part of on campus and off campus, all trying to shift and change things. Like an example would be, since the provost is sitting there, it's the provost um, um, council, right, on diversity, equity, inclusion. I was one of the um, co-chairs of the founding of that um, committee that helped bring about two pieces of change at UNM. No UNM student can graduate without having a class that's on diversity, equity, inclusion, and power, right? Mm -hmm. And that is one thing. A second one that took many, many years is shifting and changing the hiring practices so that we actually ask um, staff and faculty, what's your demonstrated commitment to equity inclusion, right? And, and it's a shift from just saying, you know, what do you believe about it, right? Because people can Wikipedia, right? But <laughs> what have you actually done? And that matters, right? But that takes that's like four to six years for some of those shifts. And then off campus, an example of that sort of incubation of new ideas and new um, initiatives, we were part of the um, Native American Community Academy's NACA Inspired Schools Network, right? And this is a network that helps start schools from that indigenized perspective. And um, they asked us to work in the international district. And um, they asked us because of a longstanding relationship with NACA and NISN. And also because um, the international district, right? Largest number of urban natives, um, refugee asylum seeking families. There's so many, um, you know, low income families in that neighborhood. And I come from a displaced um, family group. My parents were factory workers with, you know, um, middle school education. There's this sort of connection that I had with the international district they knew, right? And so we helped um, charter a school in the international district that was based on, and this is that community mm -hmm. engagement, the families, the communities all um, came together for two years to help name what it is that they want in that school. And it was restorative justice, ethnic studies, and food as medicine. And um, it's been chartered, it's still to start, right? So we're, we're not giving up hope, the families aren't giving up hope, it will one day be a school that will start in the ID. Um, but because that school didn't, um, it's been chartered but didn't start, we took the Food as Medicine Network and that became its own network of all the partners and collaborators who actually want a whole school model where food in the cafeteria and everywhere is um, what they want it to be, right? It's culturally responsive, it's things they can recognize, it's healthy, it's locally sourced, all of those things. So that network is trying to push for that kind of change in our schools. So there's that big umbrella. And then there's all of the youth development work that we do. And that is the longest standing. We've been here 27 years or so, mostly under the radar. And um, we've been working with young people in various projects. And um, I'll get to some of those other things we do, but I'll get to the, um, the projects that we're a part of. So let me start with UNM Service Corps, the oldest one that we've worked with. And that those are full-time university students and we take on Central New Mexico Community College students. And they are in community at least a year. And they're with those communities 15 to 20 hours a week. This is what they do. This is their parallel education as they are um, studying in college and we try and sort of connect them to nonprofits and community-based spaces that really help them connect their studies to outside and have the outside really help them enhance what they do in the school and actually figure out what they want to do in life right they learn from the networks that they have there um, and I'll talk about the impact in a second so NSF STEM is a collaboration with College of um, School of Engineering and it's really to sort of have engineering students work in small groups with nonprofits with community identified projects that the young people can address, right? And, um, and so that has been running for a while. We've got Food as Medicine, that larger network I spoke about, anti-racism workshops and um, initiatives. So this is huge for us. People's Institute for Survival and Beyond is um, an organization that's shaped what we do. Um, we've become core trainers, some of us in the mix. 
And it helps have that framework that it's about structural racism, it's about structural in inequality, and we should really be looking at things in that way and not just serve, right? Because then we might even be perpetuating some of the harm. And then Ailey is the Anti-Racist Youth Leadership Institute, high schoolers getting involved in similar kinds of um, projects as well. But they actually do that for about a month in the summer, and then they're civically engaged throughout the year. And I want to mention public allies, and I want public allies to stand up and our staff because I brought them here. <laughs> so they're up there. They, these are the public allies. Thank you. And the regional director up there as well, and the staff of public allies, all of that bunch over there who are refusing to stand up, but there's, there's staff up there as well. Um, thank you, thank you for all the service you do. And um, public, <laughs> yeah, I, so this is the we, right? There's no like, oh, Kiran, the center, the um, people, right, that are involved. There's a huge number of them, but public allies, they're committing a whole year of service, right, to nonprofits. And we, um, you know, the, the vision mission of public allies is so similar to CEC. It's all about um, a just, um, creating a, a just world for and a diverse um, leadership to sustain it, right? Which is what we want. And so um, know that they're in nonprofits for 1,700 hours, right? In 10 months. So we're talking 42 hours a week. And you're wondering, how can some of them be students? Well, you ask the grad students at UNM what they have to do, right? To get through school. And so um, it's the students that have to sometimes, you know, be engaged in that way. And then it's people that have left university and not sure what they want to do, right? They might not be in higher education or wanting to, um, they can't get that career track job. And there's others that want to just commit. This is like domestic Peace Corps, right? This is an American program. They want to give to New Mexico. And so we have all of them and we have, um, some that go straight out of high school and they're actually um, part of public allies as well. And they want to do that um, as what they do. And this is a little bit more about them. Just look at the pictures because I said everything else. <laughs> um, and you'll see some of the things they do. We have the symposium as well, um, which is once a year. It's a space to actually have, oh, we might have to call it the other community engagement symposium this coming year, <laughs> but it's going to be, <laughs> but it's going to be, um, one where it's the young people and it's community members and it's faculty and it's staff and students of UNM as well. But this is some of, you know, what are the apprenticeships, uh, apprenticeships about? Um, and these are paid internships, right? And apprenticeships. We never have that sort of voluntary connection to community because um, we learned very early on. In fact, the very first year we did it, where we said, oh, let's just have volunteers. And they were all people who could afford to do that, right? And so we had to figure out how do you pay people to do this? Partners, you won't be able to read that, but it's a heck of a lot. And they keep changing every um, every year because we'll recruit. These are some of the trainings I talked about, some of the impact, right? So um, cost benefit ratio. Um, and I'll say this in front of the provost, um, we do not receive any ING monies or um, RPSP monies. Um, it's all soft monies, except for the students of UNM giving monies for our um, students to be engaged. But I know that's the pattern across the university. And I know so many people are doing it without actual institutional funding, but we can change that as a collective. And we can do that together, right? This isn't, you know, I am UNM as well. And then this, this is a full-blown um, institutional review board study that hasn't been published yet. But these are the, the findings, the initial findings of how this impacts the students. Um, and we know it impacts um, the university in terms of graduation and all of that and getting these scholarships coming back to the university having young people have a sense of purpose in what they wanna do in terms of their studies. And then it impacts our communities because we know that they come back year after year. Um, 25 years ago, one of the first partners, still a partner, right? And so we know that um, New Mexico benefits from all this. And yeah, these are some of the funding. And that's it, folks. That's what I've got for you. And 
Um, questions welcome, sorry, Shannon. <laughs> Where did the microphone? Is this the microphone? Where did it? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think I'm gonna take this. That seems too slight for my voice. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shannon Sanchez Youngman. I am an assistant professor um, across Lomas um, in the College of Population Health. And I am one of those people that the first uh, panelists spoke about as a returner. I'm a native New Mexican. Um, my family comes from the Belen Tome area, and I have a lot of deep roots um, to that farming community and the land grant there. I'm going to be talking you, to you today a little bit about the UNM Center for Participatory Research, and it looks like my slide didn't make it all on there, but that's okay. <clears throat> I'm the Associate Director for Research and Evaluation. Um, Nina Wallerstein is our director and was unable to be here today. She's visiting with her son in New York, which is good for her. And Rebecca Ray is our other Associate Director who really manages all of our efforts related to um, indigenous CBPR work. Uh-oh. I'm not sure what happened here, but let me um, let me make let's just make the best we can do here. Um, so our mission as a center is to really support a collaborative environment, both with UNM and with outside partners, both within New Mexico and across the country, with the core values of really engaging in community engaged research work that is social justice oriented. And that is really aimed at eradicating and remediating inequities related to social and health um, um, inequities. So we've been talking a lot about engagement today, and we've heard a lot of people talk about engagement from pragmatic experience, um, from historical public history, um, from business um, integration. The work that we do is really centered on a collaborative approach to research that really equitably involves people in all aspects of the research process and recognizes the strengths of multiple ways of knowing and doing knowledge production. Our approach and the work that we do is really centered on when people are engaging in let's say health research for example, that they're really going and partnering with community members to research a topic of importance and to bring in community knowledge and perspectives along with academic expertise and knowledge to improve the community and eradicate health equity outcomes. What's important about this kind of research is that while many of us do observational work that's grounded within the typical academic setting, our approach is also very action oriented. Our center engages in research that is designed to actually solve and tackle problems that real world people face and to also really celebrate resilience in communities. We heard that a lot in our first panel um, from people who came from all over the state. So as an approach, we are really interested in moving outside of the walls of academia and doing pragmatic research that has implications for injustice. So this is just a simple slide that summarizes kind of the core values of how we approach the work. We say that our research is not on, it's not for, but it's with community. So when we engage in research initiatives from start to finish, community organizations, community stakeholders, grassroots community are all part of the research process from start to finish. We don't just go out and collect data and report and get feedback from communities. Through our efforts, we're really involving community throughout the process so that we're really co-creating knowledge. 
A major aspect of our center is promoting indigenous health and wellness. And the mission of our um, indigenous and health and wellness work is really centering on not only doing research that involves the co-creation and the use of indigenous knowledge, but Rebecca Ray, who runs this portion of our center, is really working on civic engagement and mobilizing indigenous communities to be uh, part of the research process. And she does substantial work on this new concept, or not new concept, but important concept of data sovereignty. She says that when we talk about indigenous data sovereignty, we need to think about the historical mistrust that exists within communities that is rooted in colonial mindsets and that true partnerships are really honoring and figuring out how research institutions like ours conduct research in ways where the data doesn't just belong to UNM, but it's shared and returns to communities who can use it for sustainability efforts moving forward. Just to give you a sample of some of our indigenous initiatives, um, Lorinda Ballone, who's not here today, but her daughter is, she's in the audience. She's led a long-term um, effort called the Family Listening Program, which has been a collaboration um, between the College of Ed, our center, and UNM tribal communities to strengthen cul culture-centered intergenerational family wellness. That program has been funded through multiple cycles from the NIH, and now her initiative is really working on how to disseminate and implement the findings throughout the state of New Mexico. <laughs> we also have a really popular initiative called Res Riders, which is a year-round leadership program that utilizes extreme sports activities to build strength and coping and leadership skills among Native American youth. This project started out as an NIH funded research project, but it was so successful that it's been sustained after 15 years post funding period. And finally, through our indigenous efforts, Rebecca runs the Tribal Data Champions Initiatives, um, which is a year long program that's exercised with tribal community partners. And through the process, folks are learning how to divine, govern, protect, and control the collection of their data. So what we're doing in this initiative is really looking at how do we build capacity within our communities, within our tribal communities, so that they can push back better when PIs like us, faculty members like us, come and ask them to do research in their communities. So the other major component of our center functions around CBPR research and evaluation. And this is where my work is more centrally located along with um, Nina Wallerstein. So in this arm of our center, what we've been really trying to work on over the last 15 years is there's a lot of folks doing CBPR research across the country. We set out through a number of national initiatives to understand what is the science behind this? Why are some partnerships more successful than others? And how does this kind of work impact long-term outcomes in health and social equity? So this just gives you a sense of the stages of funding that we've gone through. And it started back in 2009, and now we're in um, um, stage four of our funding. Um, importantly, what we've learned is that we surveyed over 500 partnerships across the country. So we've developed a set of metrics that helps us understand what is it about partnering processes that make research community-centered, okay? In our more recent work, 
we're really aiming to develop and implement interventions that are around institutional transformation. So we've learned a lot about what makes successful partnerships um, um, impactful, but we learned through our work that partnerships are not enough. Academic health institutions have a major role to play in figuring out how we can scale up these processes and also leverage more structural power within communities at a bigger scale. So in our more current funded work, we just went through a process, an engagement process with Stanford, um, Morehouse School of Medicine, and um, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And we were able to co-develop with those institutions some successful organizational interventions that we're hoping to pilot and test in our next round of funding. So for us, moving forward, it's important to understand all of the dynamics that level the playing field and help alleviate power relations. But moving forward, it's necessary that we start talking about how we scale this and do this at the academic institutional level. I'm not gonna go through our whole model in full, but through our years of work, we've been able to work both nationwide and in New Mexico with stakeholders from all sectors and across the country to develop a framework and a model for what it looks like to really do engaged work that leads to health and social justice outcomes. So this is an example of our conceptual model. And I just wanna point you right now to two, the two inner um, bubbles. We have found, and you heard this today by how people spoke, is that there are two essential crucial elements to creating special, uh, uh, effective partnerships. One is relationships. And we've heard that throughout the day, right? Relationships can be between individuals, they can be um, among organizations, but the relational aspect is very, very crucial to forming successful partnerships. And we've done a lot of work to start to understand what are the structural elements that really make this work. But since this isn't a research talk, I won't bore you with all that today. <laughs> Importantly, we find that when people are doing intervention, that partnerships are much more successful at generating long-term change when they integrate community knowledge, and when they use a variety of empowering processes in their work. Now the word empowerment is a tricky one these days, but if you're interested for more details, we've done a lot of work on really understanding and, and publishing on what empowerment means. And finally, we have found that there's a real difference between projects that go to community partners and say, I'd like your feedback on my survey. And those that really are integrating community members in the co-production of results and analysis. This just gives you an idea of some of the work we've done. We have a lot of interventions that we've developed with workshops that we've used all over the country. And this just gives you a picture of that. And as I said earlier, we're really excited about some of our new directions in our work. Um, we were, I was just recently awarded um, this NIH Research and Capacity Building Corps grant. The National Institute of Health has decided that they are going to um, attempt to fund community partnerships across the country to really do structural intervention work that addresses the social determinants of health. And we are working with Drexel University and have been awarded a sub-award to lead their research and capacity building core. So we're very excited about that work. We also have other members of our center who are providing consultation on institutional transformation for private healthcare systems. 
A good colleague of mine, Prajakta Odsal, who's involved with our center, is doing some very important work with Mayo Clinic across the country. So I'll stop there and we'll have Rob. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate all the work that everyone's talked about. I'm really in awe of all the stuff that's going on and glad you have the opportunity to really share with folks all the amazing stuff that's going on here because we don't really get to talk about it enough. Um, I had a hold on my calendar from one to five today, so I prepared a four hour presentation for you guys. So uh, I'll try to summarize things. Uh, but I have a couple of different roles related to community engagement. I'm gonna focus on the Innovation Academy here mostly, but I just wanted to touch on some of the work that we do at the Anderson School of Management in corporate and community engagement. Uh, that office was uh, established in 2021 from the relics of uh, uh, a former department or area that we had and really reformulated. And we really focused on a lot of uh, engagement issues with the community, specifically looking at businesses. We do a lot of looking at internships and how we can facilitate those for our students and for companies, particularly small businesses uh, in and around Albuquerque, and now more and more throughout the state. Uh, we also work on hiring uh, and trying to connect our students with job opportunities. Uh, class projects through our business clinic have become very popular. I think that's not that even new to faculty members across the university, but we've tried to make it a little more streamlined so that we can engage people in the community that are looking for the assistance of our class align those with course objectives and learning outcomes and provide them as a positive opportunity for both the organization utilizing those student opportunities as well as the organization. I mean, I always tell them as a, as sort of a little bit of a caveat that we are working with students. We've got about a 90% uh, satisfaction rating, but there may be a clunker every now and then, which is, which is part of the job is, is making sure people understand the learning opportunities. And then finally, through offering professional education, upskill, reskill for people in our community. Um, and we partnered with uh, continuing education to, to make us not in uh, competition, but in co-opetition. We're cooperating quite a bit. But uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Innovation Academy, and it's really placed in a good spot here. I was trying to figure out how the order was determined, but everything's kind of built and kind of has their own unique kind of place here. I thought maybe it might just be alphabetical or something, but Maybe Tim really, really knew what he was doing. Uh, so <clears throat> sometimes I'm uh, Rob Del Campo. I'm also a returner. Uh, I am from Las Cruces, the southern part of the state. So Tim and I claim to be the only people from southern New Mexico here at UNM representing. And uh, we'll fight you if you don't agree with us. Uh, but a little bit about the Innovation Academy, which is a different type of community engagement. Obviously very important working with the community and how we engage with them. And I won't go into incredible depth about each of our programs, but I'm going to hit on a couple of highlights of some things that we do uh, do. We started in 2016 uh, with a partial FTE buyout for myself and a mandate to find 10 students that were, quote, interested in this stuff, uh, which we got to. And we I think we've really we've hit that on the head and done some other things as well that I'm really proud of. Um, I think our work is really important and really impactful. And I think a lot of the tenants that um, our other speakers have brought on talking about you know, restorative justice and talking about inclusion and all these sorts of things really underlie a lot of the stuff that we believe and uh, put into place. Uh, so they're not really embedded in our presentation, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that it is part of everything that we do. Um, I call this a metacurricular program. I'm really not sure if that's even a word. Uh, definitely not sanctioned by university uh, nomenclature, but oh, there it is, it's too bad. Um, and we really perceive ourselves to be uh, an incubator for ideas, businesses, and people. All right, so we're really talking about how the interface of people and ideas and the community can really better not only the people, but also the community. We're for all students, any major, and our mission too is, is to infuse creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship into their degree programs and into their thinking as they move on and leave the uh, university. So we really sought to democratize entrepreneurship when we started. And the word entrepreneurship is incredibly problematic. Um, it has a lot of uh, connotations that are not things we were looking for. Uh, so when we started the program and I kind of hooked myself around to a bunch of classes around campus and said, who wants to be an entrepreneur? Like one person in the back of the room would like maybe raise their hand. So who wants to be on Shark Tank? And everybody, me, right? They all want to be there. So we didn't want really the nomenclature to get in the way 
of people participating in something that could be incredibly helpful for them, or at least the tenets of which are going to serve them in any career or really any endeavor that they seek to uh, engage themselves with uh, as they leave the university. So we have the Innovation Academy, which is really a catch-all for, for many terms, but it really is more than just entrepreneurship. A little snapshot of the students that engage in our program. We're around 2,000 students that engage with us right now. That's probably pretty close to our cap. 50% um, female students, 50% students of color, 65% first-generation college students, really resonating the mission that we're talking about, about creating opportunity for themselves and really chasing into something that could be productive for them in the future. And providing a safe space for failure, a safe space for success, and a safe space for whatever kind of lies in between. Uh, we have students from 88 different majors across the university now. This ranges from philosophy to medicine, from law to engineering, to business, to education. Um, and about 400 students have received uh, academic credit for the work they've done uh, on building their businesses. We've had a little fewer, a little more than 250 businesses established by students while they are in school since our inception, and we're really proud of that. We dole out a lot of money to students, and just recently our students have started to see some investments uh, from the local community. So these are um, equity level investments for students to take their businesses and move them forward. The big end of our funnel, and this is actually happening next week, I will invite you all to join us on the 8th of November at 5.30 p.m. at Bow and Arrow Brewing uh, as our pitch competition. So we have our students with their ideas. They come out 90 seconds. They don't need a prototype. They don't need a mentor. They don't need any money. They just need some way to record those 90 seconds and to get themselves over there to, uh, to give the, their, their pitch. Uh, it's really great. We have people that come out and a lot of these students uh, receive great mentoring and coaching from people in the community after they kind of engage with them and really kind of keep the fire burning uh, for, for their entrepreneurial interest. We also have our, our Tech Navigator Challenge, which is really a community um, involved competition that we have which utilizes a national laboratory technology. So we take uh, patents, we take um, non-confidential summaries from either San Diego National Labs, Air Force Research Lab, or Los Alamos National Lab. We've also used uh, Rainforest Innovations here uh, at UNM. And students who are typically non-technical then work with the uh, PIs uh, or the technical leads at the national laboratories to create commercialization plans for these technologies. So they're taking something that's really kind of esoteric, was maybe created for a defense purpose, and then they're talking about how they might be able to launch that in a competitive market. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for them to learn a little bit about tech transfer. Um, and it's really great. It's been a great way for us to create pathways uh, for students who don't typically pursue technology degrees, um, i.e. Uh, marginalized uh, communities as well. And uh, in fact, this past year, two of the top teams, the ones on that side, uh, actually took testing and evaluation licenses for the technology that they worked with uh, from the National Labs. And Sandia uh, very kindly did not charge them for those licenses to, to think about what it might look like. Uh, so for example, what are these things that we're talking about? Uh, one group there has a technology basically that uses uh, cell phones to test for malaria in the field, right? Uh, it was designed for other purposes, but that was what they kind of thought of might be a great way to use um, either in remote areas or in underpopulated areas, something like that. Uh, we have talked about the Disney College program here a little bit as way of how we really work with uh, our interns and how we place students in different types of internships. Uh, this is a great opportunity for students to receive some credit uh, working in uh, creativity uh, and innovation uh, for Disney, but we also place students closer here to home, but we really want to focus on creating opportunities for them to provide value to these organizations while also learning about uh, the opportunities in professional environments. We have a number of courses that we offer, um, including uh, the local hackathon, uh, our e-commerce courses, which I'll talk a little bit more about here, and then the um, the idea incubator, which is really the place for them to get credit for working on their own idea. Uh, another example of our engagement here, and this is a little wordy for the slide, so I'll, I'll summarize it for you. It's Friday, we don't need to read, uh, at least for work. Right? Um, <clears throat> but a way that we have, have sought to engage other folks in our work uh, is that we are now working with uh, a couple of universities uh, in Japan 
uh, and they have brought several of their students here uh, a couple of different times to work on their startup ideas in the New Mexico market. So they come here for a week. Uh, we kind of take them around town. We may talk to people. They work with mentors. They work on their pitches. And then on the Friday, they will pitch in English, which is terrifying for them, but they are amazing. Um, it's been quite a bit of fun. And now we have the reverse opportunity to, to offer to our students as well. Uh, so we're, we're kind of keeping it, keeping it even there. Um, and we actually, this past time, have picked up a couple of exchange students uh, who were here for a couple of semesters. And now we have one who actually has transferred to UNM uh, because they really enjoy it. So we're kind of looking at a worldwide opportunity to uh, commercialize products and work with the community and that sort of thing. Uh, two of the exchange students are actually finalists in the pitch competition next week. So here's it. We have a community course called Create Cell Bank that we offer for free. Um, because we understand that a lot of students, particularly those that are traditionally interested in entrepreneurship, don't have time to take a three credit class. I mean, we'd like to get them started in thinking about how they can work with customers, uh, understand ethical business practices, understand how to work with suppliers, source products, all those sorts of things. And so we offer our community create sell bank course uh, free to students and to community members. Uh, interesting timing that this happened. We offered it right around the time of us kind of getting shut down. Everyone sent home, lots of people laid off. We served uh, 250 people per semester doing during the pandemic in the community, taking these courses. Everything from businesses in areas like uh, Raton and JAL, trying to find ways to move their businesses um, online, or folks that have been displaced from other jobs, trying to look for other sources of income. And there's lots of great success stories we could talk about. Um, and it really was happenstance. And we've decided to continue it because the, the cost is very minimal, but the funding uh, came from an EDA grant that we received the University Center in 2018. Uh, also, we engage in the i program, which is really an interesting take on community engagement, you might say. So we're part of uh, an amalgamation, amalgamation, a collaboration of organizations here. So it's us, Caltech, University of Utah, UCLA, USC, UC Riverside, Colorado, Colorado State, um, and that's it. Uh, but we are in a group of the Western United States who are providing opportunities for people to test out product ideas, right? So the goal here is really to provide training for people to go and do what we call customer discovery. So far too often when people have an idea or a prototype, they don't understand how it will impact the community or potential customers or how they could very easily alter it to be even more useful. So what this training provides, um, and it's provided uh, online by all of these universities at no charge, uh, the National Science Foundation pays for, for this to be done. And it gives them an opportunity to engage with those customers before they even build their, their true prototype, their MVP as it were. So it's a great opportunity for uh, people that work in labs here on campus, uh, students who are creating intellectual property to really identify how they can properly uh, and ethically serve uh, their, their potential customers. So here's some more information about how you can find more about us. There's our, our uh, QR code, you can jump on there. We have free resources in addition to the e-commerce course. We also do a crash course of Entrepreneurship 101 which is entrepreneurship in 45 minutes. Uh, I think I'm in one or two of the videos, so I apologize for those ahead of time. Um, we have a number of other programs that we've sort of expanded into. Uh, the Regional uh, uh, Scholars Connectivity Project uh, is, is funded by the Department of Education and the NSF uh, with Dr. Montoya down here and myself and another uh, individual. And we are training students in rural New Mexico to think about the concepts of STEM entrepreneurship and how they can use those to impact their communities currently, right? Or if they do and will pursue higher education, how they can take that information back to their community so it's not so scary. Uh, it's a really great opportunity for us to engage their families and really think about how they can be impactful uh, in a very powerful way. We had our, our uh, cohort here on campus last week and it was just an amazing opportunity. Uh, additionally, we've, we've spread out and we are running an accelerator program in Santa Fe right now. We have 10 local companies from Santa Fe that are all uh, socially, social responsibility based. Um, and the exciting piece of that is that we also have four student companies going through the accelerator program at the same time. So there are 14 of them, all 
looking to impact the economy of northern New Mexico and really thinking very uh, intentionally about social responsibility while they're building their businesses. So lots of cool stuff like that, lots of fun. I cut it down from four hours to about 12 minutes for you guys. So, all right, thanks very much. Well, I am, you know, it's wonderful hearing about all this uh, fantastic work. We have quite a bit of time for a uh, discussion, uh, questions, comments. And so I, um, you know, that, so I open it up now. I do have some questions, so maybe I'll start with one and then uh, certainly welcome anyone to ask a specific question about um, an initiative or maybe a more general question about this. I mean, I think we are all here because we believe that, you know, the university's engagement in community uh, or the university being involved in community engagement is worthwhile. And, is, and in fact, you know, from my perspective, more than worthwhile, but very, very important. And I am, you know, in, impressed with how much work uh, you're all doing. And one question that I, you know, we heard pieces of this, but how you got started and how you're able to sustain this work. Uh, because it is something that we know is that there's a lot of good energy gets things started, and yet a lot of initiatives aren't able to sustain themselves. And this is something that we're we certainly want to ask that so we can figure out how to sustain more of this really great work. And so I know we heard a little bit, Rob, saying <laughs> how you got started, but just any piece of that. And if that's, you know, just one initiative within the Center Institute or uh, the Center and Institute itself. So I'll say that you know the community has been sort of incredibly important in that that regard. So you know uh, by engaging different individuals and seeing the value that we can provide them, uh, you know, from even from a fiscal perspective, you know they're making investments in what we're doing monetarily through gifts. Um, you know we don't ever solicit those really. Um, we have we have people that do that obviously. You know how that works at the university. Um, but it's it, when we make an impact and connect with folks, obviously it's been a great way to do that. Plus, some of the you know, early successes are kind of harder, I think, than later successes. As we had some wins early on, that obviously gives you some track record with funding agencies to really kind of continue on the snowball and move from there. I think Shannon really had a great model with her sort of four phases of things. And when you don't skip one or they all work out, it's definitely, definitely a great thing. But uh, it's almost like, you know, the last grant was the easiest, but the first one was the hardest. <laughs> I mean, I think I would echo what you're saying. Um, in, the, in terms of the center I work with, I'm an assistant professor sitting up here. Um, and what I would say has made me really successful is that working with the law student who's a distinguished professor. Part of the model when we deal with your consumer page work will be really focused on engagement, both within the academy and with communities. So it's something that we take um, really seriously in the work that we do. Um, you know, we're collaborating on something um, for the grand challenge. It's really getting past the I piece and setting aside your academic ego and really just collaborating with folks over time. You develop core relationships and it's really most, it multiplies is what I would say. Um, it's not without its challenges, this kind of work. Um, I'm a community engaged researcher. I do a lot of publications with the communities that I work with. It's time consuming for um, it requires showing up all the time, right? I can't do a Zoom focus group in here when I'm working in the community basin. I've got to go down and really be there and really build a rapport with those communities. But it's doable, and you know what? It's kind of more fun than the work that I used to do just in my office, is what I would say. Um, but I think there's a lot of exciting engagement going on on our campus. I see a lot of students or younger people in the room. I think a lot of it's just really trying to connect with folks. Um, we're always excited about working with our students. Look at what you're doing with your center. 
Um, so I think that this is an exciting event that's going on because hopefully we can see each other and be more visible to each other. Yeah, so how did we get started? And it is, uh, you know, the story is similar in that it's community driven, right? So it was um, community identified me um, in 1997. Um, there was a lot of gang violence in Albuquerque at the time, and community groups came together with UNM faculty, staff, students, and for a whole year, we're sitting with each other trying to figure out what it is that we need to do, right, to move forward. And, um, you know, there were families who had lost a kid to another family from another neighborhood all sitting in that space, right, that sort of restorative space. And um, and when you sit, and this is what Chan said as well, is that you really got to show up, you really got to be there, you got to build the relationships, and you've got to um, really be with those neighborhood partners and then um, they being the way that we sustain ourselves as well, right? So how we started and how we sustain are kind of connected because um, I remember the first Kellogg grant we got, I didn't even apply for it, right? <laughs> it was um, neighborhood partners all knew that, you know, um, they they wanted you know, service call members, they wanted, you know, people to engage. They went and spoke to Kellogg without me even knowing. And then Kellogg approached us and said, hey, you know, for 11 years, that's how we were sustained by Kellogg, right? Full operational. But uh, yeah, so the communities helped us sustain. And our current model, right? Public Allies National is a, a national organization where the local host, UNN, is the host for um, New Mexico, right? And that relies on nonprofit partners actually putting in a substantial amount of the allies' stipends to have them there. And then the America drawdown funds help the operational. And so um, it's back to our partners, but now it's national partners too, right? That are helping us do that. So that's how we've sustained. Um, is it sustainable, right, in the long run? is the big question, right? So how will it, you know, to keep your principles straight, I think that's the key piece, right? Because money's out there and, you know, you can apply for different things, but you, you want to be values driven, right? And that is where, you know, because yeah. funders sometimes change. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is Jeff Lee. Um, in 2004, the stone was newly you know, erected and dedicated as the first major school of architecture built in 2000. Everybody was still more focused than that on the new learning space from the floor. And um, <clears throat> basically, what happened was that the new school that was uh, sponsored by American Institute of Architects and uh, Figure it was the 150 most good um, um, examples of architecture in the United States. So I got all fired up and the office and I was down and I said, so let's do what we do. And there was no representation of native architecture at all. So basically, that just came out. And I started um, talking with colleagues and uh, began to sort of Relay some discussion around why is that case? Why is it that our professions, which I feel are really strategic in terms of thinking about how it is, so we can call our communities to rethink themselves, and in particular because we come from a legacy of settler colonialism, uh, very a lot of destructive, simulated types of policies, and trying to transform us into the other, then. Um, as we try and pull down all of this and think about the kind of challenges that we brought to our community, and how is it that we build our sense of sustainability and resiliency back again from the standpoint of not just technology and suffering all the impacts that we heard, but in the sense that we can come from the same way, offering new views for the knowledge of the ancestors in order to be able to reposition ourselves. By using uh, traditional knowledge, but contemporizing that within the context of how it is that we then build our own communities that we inherit in a way that is really meaningful and key uh, in order to be able to sustain, particularly our culture and language within our situation. So we've been doing a lot of work in our 
I'm trying to figure out how we talk about this, how it is that we begin to nurture our own, especially looking at uh, students, but also we begin to reach out to anybody who um, basically has a reason for the topic of the community. And also we can begin to nurture those that are our partners who may be on the campus in a way that they help the work to be able to facilitate the kind of process. So, so and, and we're really placing ourselves in the way that we can try and bring this kind of expression and be able then to transform the conversation so that people in the general community can then relate to each other and do it in a way that they can really express it in their own self. And at the end of the day, um, as others have articulated in many different kinds of communities that we have, they basically have said, if we don't want to learn with our children, then how are we going to know the rule that it's going to be said is inherited? And if we don't want to learn, then we don't know our culture, we don't know our language, we don't know our place, we don't know our ceremonies, we don't know any of these kinds of things. So that would be a great building if it really becomes fundamental to how it is that we begin to advance our way of beginning to develop what we call the digital kind of toolkit, which is comprised of different ways of bringing these kinds of skills that we're adept at the way we are in the society in order to begin to facilitate that process of how it is that we're beginning to get learning, being the other way actually beginning to express themselves in some natural way. So that's why I said started right here because as long as we see ourselves as being invisible, we can facilitate not even acknowledge the, the tradition of building and design and uh, community development and seeing the professions uh, take these basically uh, um, I don't want to say strong, but essentially usurping in the sense of the fact that they claim that it's their uh, innovation, ideas like green technologies, like green technology, things that we're now dealing with in terms of climate change and how it is that we need to go back to the plan, the land back on the model. All these kinds of things were integral to how it is that our community themselves were determined in the first place. So let's acknowledge that, let's re-embrace it, let's re-energize it, and let's take it back and be able to define it in a way that really, in a sense, achieve what it is that we want to see in terms of our vision and for some sort of future of them, some way of taking it from conversation to actually empowering ourselves into the future in terms of the uh, who it is that we are. And we disappear in all of the things that we desire to be back. Maybe just one follow up along these lines, picking up on Karen's point on sustain about being sustainable into the future. If um, are there challenges that you see about sustaining your work, and and if you have thoughts on what this might look like for institutional infrastructure to support that work as well, because you know thinking about that any thoughts on that in addition to what you've also well sustainability is always a huge huge challenge the way that we operate is basically we're going to partnership between the groups that we're working with so you know we're talking the research model of saying you know what's going to take the to be what we said and then we take a little bit of that in terms of who we are overhead and then to be able to continue um, working on this. But on the other hand, we've been successful, especially within the last two or three months of the sessions and also finally the university has uh, warmed up to it. And it's largely as a result of the Asa Martinez initiatives that have gone on in terms of finally bringing that conversation of what is it that's going to be necessary in order for organizations like ourselves not to always exist from the hands of the mom. So um, we have to be able to secure 
uh, funding for the last two years that um, actually go to our um, um, FDG uh, in order to provide us at least two thirds of the funding for our staff. And then on that, everything that we do in terms of negotiating with um, our ability management plan adds on to that. So we, we got that kind of sustainability model ongoing, but we're trying to firmly position ourselves so that we become a big wealthy university in terms of being really um, uh, have the ability to um, continue so that we can stop worrying about how many people we go out and address all the kinds of RFPs that are out there, but instead um, build our own internal initiatives that we get to go about because then we have a solid core upon which we can uh, build and extend our approaches. So um, we've been fortunate that our friends here is to develop this training and development, which uh, brings us a little bit of stuff too. And we'll continue to grow that. But I think, you know, we have to like, take sort of the business model approach kind of figure out exactly how it is that we stop deficit spending all the time and sort of grow that corpus so that we can essentially. Um, Take on the same role as foundations do in terms of you know, being able to generate a way of building that capital so that we can then depend year after year on the interest and then use that as a way to work to be able to build our bases of advocacy so that we can sustain themselves. And then the second part of that is we've been very attentive to the scholar aspect of it because we are invested within the university. And we see that as being somewhat in the belly of the beast. So um, we have worked in, with our intellectual colleagues all over the country, especially in Canada as well, too, in order to begin to uh, especially uh, integrate indigenous finance being a mainstay within the foundation of the agenda. And we've succeeded at that. So we're happy to say that we've now got competition you know, in the apartment from other student universities who are now funding their own um, faculty as a uh, with specialization in indigenous times or as indigenous times. Um <laughs> a huge thing from when we came forth and they didn't even think that we were basically in the same sort of hemisphere. So I think you know that's the other thing we have to acknowledge what is our place in terms of contributing to that. Foundation. Oh, wow. Everything you said, Ken. And um, for me, it definitely um, feels odd to be like a non profit inside the university. All of the non profit partners we sit with um, often um, see us as that as well, right? They're, they're seeing how we have. And we're actually going and writing grants to similar places that nonprofit partners that we're with are writing. And so we write them together just so that they need that. Um, like, you know, you, you don't do that to your neighbor, right? And so the, I think there has to be a different model and we need to look at other universities and figure out how this can happen so that um, people aren't having to do it on top of faculty positions. I see so many faculty members just um, completely stretched, and they're doing it from the heart, right? So that means they'll do it regardless. They won't be paid, but they're they're burning out, right? Just trying to be faculty and do the other. And then um, the centers, right? There has to be something other than soft money, right? There has to, and the legislative, right? So UNM has a legislative priorities, and there are so many priorities that UNM has, right? So if you look that this is also hard, but then I think, why can't all the centers and community engagement be a legislative priority, right? Why can't that as a whole initiative, so we're not even, there shouldn't be any competition between the centers, there shouldn't be competition between the faculty trying to get grants for community engagement. Anyone that wants to do it should try to be able to do it. And, and then we will have a culture shift, you know, at the institution. But um, there has to be a different way. Right now, soft money is just not, not realistic. 
both of your comments, I I concur with. I'll take a different angle on it, so it's interesting. Very um, we're very soft. I mean, we operate solely mostly on energy. I mean, I primarily, or our center primarily works in the fields of health interventions and health equity. And so for us as a center, yes, it's important for us to have all of these things to sustain what we're doing in partnership with the community. But from a more macro perspective or global perspective, we're very interested in thinking about how do we shift resources, resources that are going to academic institutions into communities to solve some of the long-term health problems that we face. So for example, I do a lot of work in inequities related to well-being. I can go out and leverage federal dollars and work with community partners to generate resources to develop innovations. But the truth is, is that if we're really interested in solving inequities, that's a very long-term effort. And so for us, the bigger question is how do we work at a scalable level? so that resources are equally going to the importance of what we do in academic institutions is key. But also, how do big federal funders also shift some of the resources to local communities, let's say in Northern New Mexico, who aren't gonna have access to those funds in the first place? <laughs> so that's our goal. We're interested in generating more community power. And I'll take a slightly different angle as well. And it's somewhat of a compliment to the, to the university uh, as well, is that obviously I think that people well said, but I think events like this and other educational opportunities throughout the universities, university to, to educate faculty, administrators about what people are already doing in these areas, so that we can create redundancy in some of these spaces, right? So that the new shiny particular research center doesn't just pop up in uh, engineering or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Today, why don't you partner with these guys? Or, you know, uh, if, if Ted needs some uh, some entrepreneurship training for something that you can work on, you can come to us and say, hey, let's work on this project together. It's not recreating the wheel and creating these synergies across what's already existing rather than chasing a new shiny object. And I think we do a pretty good job of that, but I think there's just also so much going on that we don't know the threat and depth of, of the capacity that everyone has. So uh, I think you know, money is money, and it's always going to be a problem, or or it's not probably is. But I think you know, thinking about how we can really um, look for competitive advantage by looking at specific areas of expertise. I will take this for any questions or comments. And then one out here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Catherine McGill. Like my Rob, I think I was there in the dark, but um, the I'm the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. I walked in, uh, Rob the posted in the hallway. I looked to see if I saw someone like me, and I came into the room. I would further see if I saw someone like me and I did not. And so, like Professor Mohola, I'm wondering, you know, in your very eloquent, very kind way, what it will take so that the room is much more diverse and that we are looking to um, assist with something that I spend a lot of my work time doing which is to overcome the tricultural myth in Mexico, that is one of the reasons why when I come to these forums and it's usually, you know, I'm one of the only, I am not represented. And so like my grandma used to say, when we know better, we must do better. And so my challenge to the university, and I think um, Tim Castillo for inviting me here today. And I've had the opportunity to work with Shannon and with Karen 
and I've certainly heard about you, um, Dr. Hohola, for many, many years, and uh, glad to meet Rob on the panel and all the other panels. <clears throat> but if you go back and just like rewind, there was not one single thing about someone who looks like me. So my challenge is to the University of New Mexico is what do we do about that? And there is another Well, first, thank you very much uh, for sharing your wisdom and your experience in being a microphone to the community second representative. Um, some of the words that had come up were redundancy and resiliency. And when I think of resiliency, I think of grass in terms of how every time when you mow it, it grows back. Um, and my question is, who keeps mowing that grass? And all the, and all the, and who keeps calling the things that grow in it weeds um, when it is part of the ecosystem, it is part of the community. Um, speaking of redundancy, yes, having to be aware of uh, making sure we don't repeat programs, but how do we also make sure we're not making one program that act, like actively or unintentionally or unintentionally but actually um, works against the efforts of another program. Because what I've realized, um, I'm, a, I'm honestly a visitor to New Mexico. After a year and a half of engaging with this community um, at UNM, realizing that we can say community engagement and be having two separate conversations. And so I'm curious about um, what are the day-to-day -day practices that each of uh, your departments do to ensure that, because um, there aren't two sides, there aren't the people who are working towards anti-racist, decolonial activities, and the people who are working towards purely capitalist ones. Our engagement with youth, with youth and the future makes all of us invested in everyone's well-being. And so, yes, what are some of the techniques that you do in your meeting, when you're speaking with students, to ensure that everyone is having the same conversation towards um, active decolonialization, uh, anti bias, and towards uh, life affirming practices. Invite the panelists to respond to uh, the both comments, like two, two separate yeah. comments and questions. <clears throat> Sure. Um, I love the uh, the analogy you made to mowing the lawn. And uh, unfortunately, I would say that people out in the world who are mowing the lawn are those people who are then have essentially taken the models that essentially have not necessarily contributed in a way that actually. Um, support us in community in a way that it can begin to sustain itself using its own conceptual evolution and development. And there's so many kinds of intermediate things that are part of how it is that we even ourselves, and I love you know, the idea of how research fits into this, when we have a lot of people that come in with this kind of attitude of saying, um, you know, we're going to tell you everything that's wrong with your community. Yeah. And um, what it is that we um, have a little hand in ourselves in terms of our toolkit is to go into the community and basically talk instead about all the good things, what are the assets in the community, identify those, and then use those as the foundation for the strength of how it is that we're going to change things for the better. But again, to sort of acknowledge some of the things that I heard here, it's going to take generations in order to be able to undo the things that we sort of over the question and the other things that are our community. So it's not an overnight fix. So I think we have to sort of rethink that model. In our particular case, we talk about seven generations of planning, and we talk about how it is that um, from our ancestral you know, foundations, that there were people who initiated things fully well knowing that they were never going to live long enough to see it through the But what was the compelling thing 
and like they initiated and continued to transfer to those yet unborn generations so that they could continue that single vision towards the fruition and come up with something that was beautiful and respectable. So I think, you know, they're trying to bring that kind of consciousness back again so that we ourselves don't uh, continue going the wrong, so to speak, and instead uh, figure out exactly how we can do the nurturing this in a way that continues to flourish, but flourish in a way that also builds that strength from diversity. Because diversity is the key way that I see that we're going to be able to continue to exist because if you become monolithic, then you've lost it. If you look like the other, you've lost it. And I think, you know, too often that's the way civilization is kind of adjusted to the within this stage of the old scenarios and things that are in the future. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And um, so one of the things for us, um, you were asking what are some of our practices and what is what are we doing regarding anti-blackness in our state, right? Um, and and, and Asian sentiments. Um, that's what the tricultural myth is about, right? It's completely invisibilizing black and Asians in our state, which happens, right? Happens often. And so what we do, we have um very intentional ways. And then relational ways as well, right? The intentional ways is for people to understand root causes of what's going on, right? So public allies, I'm saying it in front of them so they can call me out on this if we haven't done it. Um, we, we want them to have some understanding of some of the root causes, historical trauma, colonization, racism, and how, um, every, you know, so we look, look at the intersectionality of everything. But until you have that, you won't have common language, common understanding, and you can't get to the also to ask the weapon, right? And then with that, and they are going to do something. They've already had, they're brand new to us, and they've already done some asset mapping and some power analysis, right? But the um, asset mapping without that, and I know that you do this as well, but structural analysis or historical understanding of colonization sometimes ends up. Um, People think um, that, oh, don't be negative, just look at the world, right? And just do the answer badly. And just the combination is needed, you know? And I know that does that in this too as well. Understanding the, um, we have to have both of those. And part of um, what Kathy was saying, so how do we do that? Um, how do we work with our young ones and our community members? Because um, what Ted, um, spoke about was that internalized racial oppression where we go on that, right? Um, where we start believing myths about who we are as people and um, what, you know, others are saying about us and think that's true, right? So how do we do, undo all of that? Because it's not just learning, it's unlearning things about yourself, right? And others. Um, we do that through um, intentionally working with people's institutes rather than beyond um, workshops. It's community organizing workshops with an anti-racist lens. And it's helping us have that common language, common understanding. And the whole of that curriculum is critical race theory. It talks about anti-blackness from the beginning. And it talks about how that manifests in um, New Mexico from a philosophical perspective too. Right? We'll, we'll talk about um, how you know the Spanish do that as well. So it's using, um, it's part of, UNM's curriculum, right? People all over the UNM are teaching this in classes all over the UNM. But if a student just gets bits and pieces or some get it and some don't, um, then it won't matter, right? You've got to have some sort of common understanding, common language about what's going on and why. Um, otherwise, we're not speaking to each other in, in a constructive way. People talk over each other, or they go in their own little subgroups, and they'll they'll think, oh, this, you know, and that's what's happening nationwide. But we shouldn't be making that happen here. We we should take the opportunity as an institution to try and have people have those conversations across the. Thank you. Thank you for the provocative. Smart question. Um, I'll just add that 
is deeply embedded in creating a pedagogical thinking. The tools that we use are always about, you know, I'm a political scientist who works in a school of population health who is interested in disruption of permanence of disease, right? So the work that we do within the community is always about a deliberation between multiple people about what are those root causes? What do they mean? And how do we create solutions that make sense? Now, there's conflict in the work that we do. And so that's part of the process of how we deliver. It's not as though uh, we take a naive approach and people sit around the table and share stories. There is a very deliberative value that we take and we use in the kind of work that we do. And for us, because we're deeply involved in the health field, it's that we're moving away from looking at individual behavioral issues and disease to really trying to understand and develop strategies that are looking at structural determinants and structural solutions that are really not that level. Now, in some cases, that might really be working on efforts that are building on, let's say, indigenous resilience and, and, and creating indigenous ways of knowing. In other instances, it really might be looking at structural reforms that have um, led to, let's say, disparities in mental health among Latinos in our state. So this is actually quite intentional, even at the micro level of the work that we do. So I thank you for your question. It's a great one. Thank you. I think I turned on in the middle of the cannons. It was good. You couldn't hear it. <laughs> so, so first, my apologies for your two things getting getting grouped together. Although they are they are similar. So, Kathy, I believe you know I think you're absolutely right, and I think you bring up a good point, and I think that's why we need to open ourselves up to these opportunities to to get. Uh, I was the wrong word, but to point you know out the opportunities that we miss in terms of inclusion of people from different backgrounds um, and from, from different opportunity sets. Um, you know, all too often we make these kind of uh, excuses, right? Well, we, I just put the call out there and that's what we kind of got, right? And, you know, it, it, I, it, we can't be held accountable for that, but um, I don't think that's accurate. And I actually come to it from uh, my academic training and most of my, my publications are in the areas uh, of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging all of those sorts of things. So, you know, we do intentionally reach out and create opportunities for, for students, specific students, um, whether they be Hispanic or black or Asian or female or from rural entities to really be able to capitalize that. And I use the term competitive advantage. And I understand that in a community engaged research session, that's probably a little bit of a no-no. But uh, I think that there are ways that we can look to students and we look to people in the community to be able to harness that, that unique value that they possess as a portion of their competitive advantage. And how do we help them through that? And how do we develop them in those sorts of areas? I briefly alluded to it, but with our, our CSP, and I said it the wrong way, our Regional Connectivity Student Project, uh, project that we're working on, you know, we're looking at rural students, we specifically sought out students from rural areas of New Mexico. And how do we address their specific concerns about being from a rural area, right? And that's one example of, of what we've done. Uh, we got some feedback from San Diego National Labs and they said, you know, we want to do this tech navigator competition, but we don't want all white men in this competition. So we specifically went out and created, started a conversation, right? Because you have to talk with the, the community like we've all talked about here is, what do you think about this? Why would you, you know, we're getting feedback that we don't have a diverse enough a representation in this, this competition. Um, how can we get more people to, to be included? Specifically, uh, I'll use women as an example. We said, we women do not operate in STEM fields at a proportionate rate. We need women to participate in this. That was enough. 
on the on the email perspective to say, okay, great. And we had 80% women participate the second year that we did it. We've done the same thing with with other groups. We've done it with uh with with black students, we've done it with with Asian students as well. And we've tried to create the sort of um uh, mentorship network uh, and done matching not only on area of expertise but also um, on the, the sociocultural aspects, right? So people can see themselves in those areas. So definitely super important. Um, to your comment on you know who mows the grass, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I should defer to the provost to see what he would like to say on this. <laughs> but in an academic institution, it's it's particularly interesting to to address, right? Because you've got the balances of academic freedom. And when I was talking about redundancy, uh, you know, I, I could see where it might've been, been taken in a different way. Um, but how do you create checks and balances? How do you have, you know, uh, uh, sort of faculty governance yet you have, you know, academic freedom? Uh, you know, and how do you have standards and practices, but then also, you know, allow people to, uh, you know, they have tenure and they're allowed to explore whatever they want. Uh, I think we actually do a pretty decent job of letting the grass grow maybe a little high here, which is great. Um, so, you know, should anybody be mowing the grass? I mean, in a utopian society, maybe nobody. But uh, I think from a, a, a reality check and a, a scarce resources perspective, I think we do a pretty good job of, of letting some areas grow and then, you know, maybe, you know, plant some new seeds in other areas. And that's Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Mark. I work at the University of the Office of the CIO and Strategic Materials Community Program. But going, I've had you know, a number of years to work on different initiatives that or as a part of the things we talked about here, I think it was almost 20 years ago, we were sort of learning, right? Mm -hmm. We've been trying that in this, but, well, not you were, but I wasn't. Um, <laughs> how do we engage our students? So here's my question, and I'm, I'm not sure how to how to shape it, so I'm sure somebody else here can. But um, the university, in my experience, we've had different kinds of uh, gatherings of uh, people um, and from neighborhood uh, where people have said, this is a foreign place, that isn't the way, that is what we said, just that way, but it's not an acceptable place. And so um, there are people like me, I'm just an ordinary person, and I, I know it's happening, and I know the tremendous work over the years that's happening in the IB, the International District. Tim is here somewhere where you're sitting, I met Tim somewhere here along the way, and I had actually hired Tucson, uh, Dr. Tucson, over from EDAC to teach something in continuing education. Anyway, the point is this. Um, I recently asked Kathy and Tim and Sue, do you want to get together? We realized that there is something in this. So I could spot something in this and that, right? So something has percolated to the top, and we'll be hearing more about that along the way here. But my question to you is, um, does that kind of thing, all these other people sitting here, you know, is this very non-academic way of just bringing people where everyone belongs around the table, and we're not talking about or teaching anti-racism. We're not teaching about the, the what is it, tricultural, I've been here with the whole thing, I don't know what it's but, but, but it happens, there's a transformation, something happens, in the human relationship, it has a right in our room, right? Happy. Um, we brought uh, people together in the community, including the CIO of, of uh, for this institution. So what's the connection of that? Community engagement. But it was down to earth, people sitting around the table doing something. What's this something we want to do? But when we get into that, those brutal facts, that surface, and we begin together to see the power of people. Uh, here in the shape of your head, so you need to help me because I don't, my question to you is, you're all very academic, and I once was, but, and that's wonderful, and, and all of that, but sometimes that doesn't translate, as we all know, into anything in our communities, and I live in one of our nation's 
in the state for many years and worked in it and have tried hard to make those pathways and connections. So help me. My question is, this pedestrian approach of mine, which is just intuitive, um, works. But does it have standing in in it that our academic institution? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So I don't think there's any plus, but I don't want to respond as if my name was mentioned. <laughs> this will probably be the last response. So as we respond, if you have any last comment you would like to make, and then we will turn it back over to Ken. Um, definitely dialogue and discussion and roundtable conversations and Really, the Prairie approach has been um, community engagement centers core. There's no way we can do this work without sitting with people in circles and building relationships. So, um, my nod is like a shake, but I actually agree with you with the um, I'm playing the academic on TV right now, and I'm in community. I, um, Engage in very different ways. It was even a way I agree with you fully. And that's probably what my work looks like day in and day out. Um, but I appreciate you sort of calling us into that in the set because we are being quite happy. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I'll be very agreed that we are in the in the in the community and used space that we're talking about. And I think you know, really, and again, I think it's also a little bit insulting to say that you can't be academic in the community, right? Right. Okay. right. No, 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 I agree. No, no, I just for not, but uh, I think I think there's that line kind of blocked. But I think the kind of next takeaway here is that everything is a two way communication uh, operation here, right? That all of the issues you brought up and everything that we talked about can. Maybe not be remedy, but I think we can at least increase our level of knowledge and the, the level of options that we have to kind of try to, to change things and, and make movements. There has to go with that, that communication in both directions. Right? And so I think it has to be accessible for people. It has to be sort of uh, at the level that they're comfortable engaging in. I'll just say one more thing because we've done a lot of work around this. It is relational, yes. But structural governance matters and sharing resources matters. And Catherine, I always appreciate what you say, but it's also about sharing the need. And we, you know, when we're doing grant funded work, we set up co governance in the project so that it's not just about being fun, mm -hmm. but that the community voices actually have a say and a vote and a decision making role in the grant. And in our work, there is a clear difference in success between partnerships that do that and ones that don't. And that's my academic side. We have evidence to back that up. So I'll just conclude with that. And we'll just help. help. So, so I'll just say that the thing that I acknowledge and I embrace is that I do recognize that I'm in a position of privilege Absolutely. and that it's taken decades in order for me to be able to move myself into a situation that in a way should be done in a responsible manner of enabling others to be able to use what it is that I've been able to bring forward so that they then have the opportunity to be able to follow and expand on it. And I think part of the problem that I see from an institutional framework and an academic is what is the commitment of academia in order to make sure that there are others who are going to be mentored along the way in order to assume this because I have, uh, <clears throat> my, my batteries are coming to an end, so to speak, right? <laughs> so from that particular standpoint, we have to talk about succession, but we have to talk about it in a very strategic way. So I think, you know, what we all share in common here is that we've all worked steadfastly to be able to build these institutions that hold uh, enormous potential in terms of being able to transform in uh, valid ways, in ways that have already been uh, 
seen as, as being uh, as working. And um, I think that's where the institution has to be able to both acknowledge and be able then to step up and say, rather than reinventing ourselves again, how can we build on this? And if it's not going to look like this, then how do we make it better? And how do we make it more akin? But it's here already. So let's just do that instead of trying to import some other framework where we start from the bottom all up again, start mowing the grass all over again. That's not going to have us anywhere from that standpoint. So. I know that if you would join me in thanking you for your responses and the panelists for their participation. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Renya, for moderating. Thank you to all the panelists. I want to give another applause to everybody that was here today. So please. As we move uh, this community engagement forward uh, here at the institution, I think we have a lot of work to do. And um, the advisory committee that I'm working with have really started to engage these, these topics and this conversation about um, you know, being able to advocate for the community, having a place where the community come to us. And I think that's one of the things that we have to figure out and, and, and create a place for uh, community members to come to the institution and have that open door and that conversation. So. Uh, in the spring, we're going to have another, um, I don't know what we're going to call it, maybe a workshop that starts to address this and really starting to look at how we retool this model and really think about it for the future and, and really for it sustainable uh, for the future. So I wanted to thank uh, Provost Holloway for uh, allowing us to have this symposium today. Thank you so much, Provost. It's been a wonderful day. Uh, I'm glad this is over. It's been a lot of work. <laughs> But uh, uh, we we do have uh, some wine and cheese and hors d'oeuvres for everybody. Uh, and so if you go down to the end of the hallway on the west end of the building in the gallery, uh, there'll be some food there and some drinks. And then uh, uh, we're blessed by the music department being able to provide some music for us. So please join us. Uh, we'll be here till about 6, 630. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon.